welcome everyone. So um, uh, to the uh, second uh, series of uh, Asian EOS uh, webinar uh, focused on interventional EOS. So I think uh, Lawrence, um, uh, the president of the Asian EOS group, um, will start with some uh, welcoming, welcoming words. Okay, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here representing the Asian EOS group. I do call the background for Asian EOS group. That's our logo. Nice. Uh, Anthony has actually asked me to, to just briefly introduce Asian EOS Group uh, because I think uh, this is uh, one of those uh, webinars which uh, the group has been organizing since the outbreak of uh, COVID-19. So I think it's also given us an opportunity to widen our scope of uh, the activities, educational activities to a more international audience as well as inviting more international faculty so I think uh, since um, some of you may not, uh, some of you may not uh, uh, know of this uh, particular group, so I thought I may just introduce you to this group. Uh, maybe I can actually share the screen. Okay. 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 So I think uh, yeah. Uh, I hope everyone can see the screen here. Can we? Yep. Okay, good. So I think uh, the group base essentially is uh, uh, obviously I think comprises uh, countries from all over Asia because it is a it was started quite a number of years ago as a group which is uh, uh, with the mission of uh, trying to to adopt increase the adoption of EUS through training, and over the years I think we have uh, gradually expand. The, and the membership to many countries uh, in uh, Asia. And we also succeeded in uh, differentiating ourselves, uh, chiefly uh, using this sort of matching uh, uh, method, meaning that we will try to match uh, trainers with trainees, and then uh, meetings uh, and using this uh, particular uh, model of ours, which is uh, dominantly hands-on. Obviously, I think since the outbreak, the hands-on has not been able to be to be done. So I think in this uh, particular uh, in this particular circumstances, I think uh, the I think the some of the members have taken the initiatives like Anthony and also Vinay Dil uh, last month to organize uh, a webinars instead. I think over the years, uh, certainly we have done quite a number of works. Um, uh, organizing many workshops, uh, such as uh, those uh, in this particular uh, slide, uh, in many different countries. And all, at the same time, we also organize train the trainers courses, uh, mostly catering for more experienced uh, EOS practitioners so that they can advance to become trainers and organize courses uh, uh, in their own uh, countries. And of late, with the event of interventional workshops, such as this particular one, uh, we have also started venturing into organizing uh, international internet international workshops. I think the strength of all this, uh, uh, how we could manage to do all this is because the members have also taken the initiatives to come up with their own training models. The different models, I think, hopefully, I think uh, Anthony can introduce some of those models in his uh, particular webinar today. And uh, over the last... Uh, I think uh, it's, it's quite unusual in the sense that we started off uh, with uh, sort of basic workshops and so forth. Then we advanced to organizing bigger scale congresses such as the Asian US Congress. I think uh, the first one was uh, organized in Korea in 2015. And it just happened to coincide with MERS. And now we are actually moving on to the era of uh, the COVID-19. So it seems that we can't escape from some sort of outbreaks. Uh, some of the times, it is our evolution of the Asian EUS group. So finally, I think uh, um, we, besides uh, organizing educational activities, we have also been quite active in coming up with uh, so-called uh, consensus guidelines. And that's also part and parcel of the mission to train EUS practitioners, especially in this uh, new area where I think uh, there's still no good so-called consensus regarding many of the international procedures we do. So that's when 
I think Anthony, quite a number of years ago, uh, took the uh, leadership to come up with uh, a group uh, which subsequently produced the consensus guidelines, which I think he'll share with you again in this uh, webinar. So finally, I think uh, without, I think uh, obviously, I think we are, we have uh, been quite busy dealing with this virus uh, since the beginning of this year. And because of that reason, I think uh, we took upon ourselves to say that we should not stop our educational uh, activities. And that's where we are resorting to technology. And with that, of course, I think we can now uh, also expand our reach to a more international audience and faculty. Hopefully, I think this will actually continue even after the outbreak because I think we found this extremely useful. So finally, I think uh, I'd like to congratulate Anthony for organizing this uh, particular course. I'm sure of you will enjoy this course and then learn a lot uh, today. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. So, um... As you can see in the uh, program, we have um, a world-class uh, faculty list. Uh, thanks to the beauty of uh, Zoom and webinar, uh, we can invite uh, everyone from the world. Um, apart from faculties, we also have uh, a lot of participants. So the, uh, the uh, statistics from Flora uh, show me that uh, up to just now, we have uh, 903 registrations. So this is quite amazing. Um, and uh, from a total of uh, 60 countries around the world. Um, the highest number is from Japan, 182 registrations. Colombia, also 128. India, around 80. Hong Kong, 50. And then um, so on. So we have people from Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Italy, Iraq. So um, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, so everywhere around the world. So it's very amazing as well as USA. So um, thank you very much all for your hard work. Uh, I'm sure our participants will uh, benefit a lot from this webinar. Uh, also thank you to our sponsors. Um, this time we are trying something new. So during break and lunch time, our sponsors will have around 20 minutes each and they can be presenting uh, something about their products or tell us something new. So uh, during break time, please also uh, check out the webinar and see uh, what they want to tell us. So uh, without th further ado, um, I'd like to introduce uh, our faculties first. So um, we have a list of faculties uh, presenting throughout the day. So I'm gonna go through uh, them one by one. So first off will be Dr. Shen Chan. She is already at the uh, webinar. And then she is from our unit. She is an uprising star in uh, interventional US. And also she is uh, recently uh, published some very important papers, including a um, uh, paper in gastro that was uh, published on uh, concerning the uh, EGD confirming it as a aerosol generating procedure. Uh, afterwards, we'll have uh, Isama Sensei. He'll be talking to us about the techniques and outcomes on US rendezvous. Doyen Park, again, a very uh, prominent leader in U.S. guided biliary drainage. He led many, many earlier studies on um, issues around CDS, HGS, and also did a very important randomized trial comparing um, USBD versus uh, ERCB. Rene, I think we all know him. Uh, he's a very prominent world leader in USBD. Uh, he'll be talking to us on, on uh, anti-grade stenting. Michel Kahale, another old friend. Uh, he is uh, speaking from USA. Uh, again, he not only in USBD, but he has also performed uh, many, many uh, pioneer studies on US uh, various UN inter interventions. Afterwards, we'll have Mark Giovannini. Again, we all know him. He did the first USBD uh, back in 2001. So um, he'll be talking to us on US versus PTBD. Uh, Kida Sensei, again, a uh, very prominent person in the uh, Asian US group. Uh, he's been uh, um, holding um, annual uh, train the trainer course in the Kitasano University. Afterwards, we will have Paolo. Um, he is from Italy, a uh, relatively new friend, but uh, he is also performing a lot of uh, US interventions, and he is also a participant in my trial 
uh, comparing U.S. fiduciary drainage versus uh, ERCP. Uh, Itohi Sensei, uh, again, not, I don't need to uh, uh, introduce him too much. I think everyone in the world, around the world, knows him very well. Uh, he'll be talking about anti-grade stone extraction, followed by uh, Manolo Perez Miranda. Again, everyone, everyone knows him. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, U.S. guided enterostomy for excess in products. And last but not least, Ogura Sensei. So he's a very prominent uh, uh, U.S. interventional and a sonographer. Uh, he told me he's done over a thousand U.S. XGS. So uh, he'll be telling us uh, about his uh, useful tips in uh, USBD as well as how we can use USBD as a means of carrying out building interventions. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to start uh, with uh, Dr. Shannon Chan, and she'll be discussing an overview on USBD techniques and the Asian US guidelines uh, on USBD drainage. Shannon, thank you. So can everyone see the uh, PowerPoint? Okay, uh, good morning. So uh, thank you for inviting me as a first speaker to speak in before all of these giants. I'm very humble and very honored to be here. Um, so I'll just give a very, very brief overview of all the EOS uh, biliary drainage techniques and uh, the consensus guidelines that uh, Lauren just mentioned uh, developed by the AEG uh, two years ago. So um, there are lots of different kinds of uh, EUS uh, guided biliary drainage procedures. Here you can see uh, this is a, a collagenocal duodenostomy with a fully covered uh, duodenal stent. Beneath you see a CDS uh, done with a hot axios and uh, with a double pigtail inserted. And the hot axios is actually here. And this is obviously an HGS that is done with a geoball. And this is a uh, gallbladder drainage with a spaxes. And this on the right side is an anti-grade um, stone extraction. And then on the on our right lower corner is an anti-grade uh, metal stenting. So all of these uh, are actually have different indications, different risks and different techniques. So which one to use and when? So two years ago, the AEG group published this consensus guidelines on the optimal management of um, interventional EUS procedures. And in it specifically has a consensus statement on the optimal management of um, EUS um, guided biliary drainage. So we will go through them one by one. Uh, there are 15 points. Uh, so first, the indications of the procedure. So first, EUS biliary drainage is recommended as a procedure of choice for biliary drainage in patients who failed uh, ERCP if the expertise is available. At that time, there were three randomized controlled trials published, and you can see that all of them are very small sample size um, studies. So the first study, actually eight years ago, uh, published by Professor Artifon, uh, including only uh, 13 versus 12 patients comparing EUS and uh, at the, at the that time PTBD as uh, the salvage procedure of failed DRCP. And you see that the technical success and the, the clinical success rates are actually very similar. All of them is 100%, and there is no difference in the adverse events. Uh, the second study then published was from Professor Lee with the slightly larger sample size, um, also with similar technical success and clinical success. However, there are some more adverse events with the PTBD, mainly uh, tube-related complications, such as uh, tube dislodgement, uh, tube blockage, et cetera. Uh, however, uh, the EUS group has a more, um, uh, and uh, the PTBD also has some more re-interventions required due to the tube-related complications. The third study then uh, tried to compare EUS with the surgical GJ, um, also with a relatively small sample size, so showing similar technical and clinical success, and there was no difference in the adverse events. So then there were subsequently uh, two meta-analyses published in this regard um, with uh, the EUS uh, guided biliary drainage. So basically uh, the conclusion is that uh, the technical and clinical success rates is very high, more than uh, 95%. And uh, the cumulative adverse events is a bit um, uh, heterogeneous. So it ranges from around 13% to 20%, even in expert centers. 
Um, in this second uh, comparison between uh, EUS-guided uh, biliary drainage and PTBD, this is a randomized control trial uh, published by um, Professor Lee and Professor Kim in the career group. So the primary out Outcome of this study was the technical success of uh, the EUS guided biliary drainage. This is a non inferiority study uh, designed with a margin of 15%. And you can see here is the results. So in terms of the technical success rate, um, EUS uh, guided biliary drainage was proved to be non-inferior to that of the PTBD. And the clinical success rate is also um, similar in both groups. Um, the adverse events, again, uh, PTBD is more, mainly uh, due to the two related complications. And also the PTBD group has more um, re-intervention rate together with a longer hospital stay. So all in all, these uh, studies um, uh, point more towards EUS guided biliary drainage uh, in case of failed ERCP, uh, but these are uh, very small randomized controlled trials um, that we have at this moment. So the second statement of the consensus guidelines is that EUS BD is an alternative procedure to obtain biliary drainage in patients with altered postoperative anatomy or duodenostenosis precluding ERCP if the expertise is available. So the success rate of these um, patients with altered anatomy um, if ERCP is actually um, not possible up to 40% of the case. And an EUS biliary drainage is a good alternative in such situation as the bowel duct cannot be accessed from the stomach. However, um, only small retrospective comparison studies are available. So in this comparative study published by Moen uh, four years ago, comparing uh, EUS biliary drainage with um, enteroscopy assisted ERCP for patients with uh, altered anatomy. So you can see uh, in the EUS BD group, majority of the cases are HDS cases. And uh, for the enteroscopy group, the technique used was uh, mainly the short type double balloon uh, ERCP. So uh, you see that the procedure for uh, enteroscopy assisted ERCP, um, it, is, ha it has a longer procedure as expected. Uh, however, the uh, hospital stay is uh, EUS group more and the technical success rate is also um, EUS uh, biliary drainage, it is, which is higher. Uh, clinical success also is a win for the EUS um, guided biliary drainage. Uh, so this is the only um, comparative study that is available at that time. Um, comparing these two techniques. Um, so then the conclusion is that if you have the expertise of doing EUS guided biliary drainage, it is a preferred technique um, over um, uh, antroscopy assisted ERCP for patients with um, altered anatomy. Um, in this um, study, there was also a univariate analysis and a multivariate analysis, and this showed that uh, EUS uh, BD has, uh, is an independent uh, factor uh, to the success of biliary drainage, and that, um, however, it is also um, related to uh, more adverse events. So the availability of expertise is uh, important in these uh, situations. So then the third statement is that in patients with a distal common bowel obstruction, the transduodeno and transhepatic approaches for um, EUSBD are used. So they try to, um, uh, to give a standard nomenclature to all these procedures because at that time, um, people call different procedures different things. So they try to have a standard approach of referring to the specific procedures. So um, EUSBD, you either um, is uh, gain access with the EUS to assist the ERCP. So this is the EUS guided rendezvous ERCP, or you do a direct drainage with the EUS guided biliary drainage, including um, the anti-grade stenting or the transmural drainage, which can be, can be divided into um, called the docal duodenostomy, also called the CDS, or um, the hepatogastrostomy, also called the HGS. So for EUS guided uh, rendezvous ERCP, uh, basically it is to, um, to achieve access with a guide wire through the papilla to help with the ERCP. So there are usually two approaches. So first approach, uh, you uh, put the scope in the duodenum, reduce the scope, um, so then the scope points downwards towards the papilla, uh, poke in the guide wire and um, uh, pass it through the papilla and then exchange to the ERCP for um, biliary drainage. Or um, in cases where this is not possible, the second approach is to 
to put the uh, scope in the duodenum in a long lip position. Uh, but this is less advantageous because then uh, you see that it, the uh, guide wire points upwards where your target destination is actually downwards towards the papilla. But sometimes um, due to the anatomy, um, this may be the only way that you can do it. So um, using a curved tip guide wire would be helpful. Or um, some people would prefer um, using, uh, uh, inserting the guide wire through the left uh, lobe of the liver, uh, through the um, IX3 on the left side, then the direction towards the papilla would be um, more um, advantageous. So um, basically these techniques have the same efficacy, either you poke it through the duodenum or um, through the stomach, as long as the duts are sufficiently dilated. So we're coming back to this. So we have seen this um, slide um, before. So all these uh, techniques, which one um, is preferred, which one is better? So this is um, a video showing um, the uh, CDS procedure with um, the Axios. So this is a patient with uh, malignant, unresectable um, pancreatic cancer. So the CBD measured uh, 15 millimeters. So um, we used a 19 gauge uh, needle to, um, to poke through the C, um, CBD, uh, confirmed with bowel aspiration and the guide wire passed up to the IHD. And subsequently, um, this is the hot axial. So you can see that the electrocautery um, um, that is um, going through the um, common bowel duct. And this is the deploying of the distal flange of the um, axios. And uh, subsequently, at that time, you were still using the um, black mark technique. Uh, the proximal flange is then um, deployed. So then this is also a short video on uh, EUS um, guided um, anti-grade stenting. Um, there will, I'm sure there is a lecture um, in the morning about this, um, which will go more into the details, but this is just a, a brief um, video on how it is done. So first we screen the left lobe of the liver for um, segment three duts, and then um, insert the needle, confirm with bowel aspiration, do a cholangiogram, pass through um, the guide wire. So in this case, um, there was a little bit of difficulty passing through the guide wire um, through um, the hyla where there was a stricture. So subsequently, um, we used a six French cystotome, um, which is currently passing through the liver into the left duts um, to help guide the direction of the um, guide wire and to support um, the guide wire through the stricture. So you see the cystotome is going through the left IHD and subsequently passing through, um, uh, passing the guide wire through the stricture. So once the guide wire um, is down, um, then the subsequent steps would be relatively easy because it is um, more similar to um, ERCP um, deploying the stent. So once a guide wire is through, um, the cystotome is followed through with um, contrast confirming the position of uh, the ampulla, um, allowing us to measure the length of the metal stent that is required. And subsequently, a metal stent um, is passed through. So um, there are studies trying to compare um, the efficacy of, uh, of uh, CDS versus an HGS. Um, this is a study also published by Moen four years ago, comparing these two methods. So um, you can see that both procedures have very similar uh, technical and clinical success rates. Um, the procedure time is actually also similar. <clears throat> the length of stay, however, um, is longer uh, for the HGS group. And uh, in terms of adverse events and the need for stent exchange during follow-up, they are similar. And in this particular study, they tried to measure uh, using a Kaplan-Meier plot to um, confirm the stent patency after CDS and HGS. <clears throat> this dotted line is the stent patency at one year. 
And you can see, although on the graph, it's very obvious that they are, um, CDS has a higher cent patency, but this did not reach uh, st statistical um, in this multivariate analysis, which we will mention this table again, it proves that the use of a mass extent and the use of non-coaxial electrocautery is associated with um, adverse events in these procedures. Um, in another study comparing HGS and CDS, um, they, um, it also showed very similar technical success, clinical success, procedure times and um, adverse events. So all in all, um, with the available evidence, uh, the conclusion is in patients with uh, distal common bowel obstruction, both procedures can be performed. Uh, the choice of the procedure is not clear, but depends on a combination of factors, including the technical expertise, uh, the stent patency rate, the risk of adverse events, and also anatomical factors, such as uh, the presence of uh, dilated bowel duct or duodenal stenosis or altered anatomy. So the fourth um, guideline is that um, a transhepatic approach to EUSBD is recommended for hyalur blocks. So uh, for patients with a hyalur stricture, transduodenal stent placement in, um, is likely to be more challenging, and uh, therefore the transhepatic approach is preferred. Uh, drainage can be obtained either with uh, anti-grade stenting or um, with an HGS. And uh, it, it is to be careful that uh, there is a risk of cholangitis when contrast is injected into undrained segments. So care should be taken to avoid excessive um, contrast injection. So the fifth um, point is more or less um, a pre-drainage evaluation, whether um, MRCP or a CT is needed uh, before the drainage procedures. So the recommendation then is if the patient has a higher stricture or a higher obstruction, a pre-procedure roadmap is required either with an MRCP or a CT scan. Um, this, um, the uh, recommendation is actually extrapolated from that of an ERCP. Uh, however, for a patient with a distal bowel obstruction, an ultrasound uh, would, and a CT scan uh, would be sufficient uh, for these low um, CBD obstructions. So the sixth statement then is more or less of a common sense. So antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended before um, these drainage procedures. And uh, this is also extrapolated from that of an ERCP from <clears throat> this Cochrane uh, review um, that prophylactic antibiotics reduces bacteremia and uh, prevents cholangitis and septicemia in ERCP. So for EUSBD, it's a very similar law, um, logic that we give um, broad spectrum antibiotics. So then this more is uh, in the guidelines onto the procedure considerations of what uh, needles or what uh, guide wires you should use. So basically a 19 gauge FNA needle is recommended for duct puncture. And the reason is because the 19 gauge allows the passage of both uh, zero point, uh, an 035 or an 025 inch guide wire. And uh, for smaller size needles, uh, smaller guide wires like an 018 is needed. And sometimes it will um, be very difficult to manipulate through and will not be strong enough to support um, the stent to pass through. And um, the use of a flexible natural needle may improve the maneuverability of uh, such positions. And uh, for guide wires, um, either an 035 or an 025 inch guide wire with a floppy tip should be used to negotiate through the duts. So the use of a guide wire uh, varies a lot in different centers and uh, it appears that both um, all sizes and uh, the whether you use a terumu or a uh, visiglide, uh, it depends on the preference of um, the center. So some people actually, uh, like a Dr. Venadia, likes to use a 250 uh, terumu to manipulate through the guide bar and with a subsequent um, uh, exchange. So um, which guide wire you use, basically, um, it depends on the center's um, preference. Um, in terms of catheters, balloons, and cystotomes, um, these are recommended for the use of tract dilatation, and that um, the tract dilatation with the pre-cut papillotome is not recommended. And this is based on this study uh, published by Professor Park a few years back, um, stating uh, in, the, in a multivariate um, analysis, um, comparing USBD uh, with um, after failed ERCP. So they identified that needle knife is one of the independent risk factors for adverse events um, for EUS guided biliary drainage. So um, the, pre, the recommendation is that pre-cut papillotome is not recommended for tract dilatation. 
Um, a six French sister tome is favored as this is fast and efficient. And a five French stiff catheters and four millimeter um, dilating balloons may be used if a sister tome is not available. So there are also some one step devices that is currently available now. I'm sure all of you is familiar with the hot, hot um, Axios, uh, the hot spexes. And also um, there was also a study in the career group um, on this uh, do stent, uh, which is a one step um, metal stent for um, HGS. So these uh, one step devices avoid the need for repeated instrumentational changes and uh, reduce procedure time. So these can be used in appropriate um, situations. As for stenting, um, fully or partially covered metal stents are recommended for transluminal stenting. Uncovered stents, on the other hand, can be used for integrate transpapillary stenting. So covered stents are preferred for transluminal procedures um, to pre prevent bile leak, as, for example, in the case of an HGS. And uh, for uncovered stents may be used for um, integrate um, EUS stenting. Um, lumen opposing stents, as shown in the last slide, such as the Axios and Spaxis, um, they are good for anchoring, so good for um, gallbladder drainages and pseudocysts, but there is limited data available for the use of um, these stents um, except in uh, CDS. So the 11th recommendation is that the use of a metal stent is recommended over plastic stents uh, for EUSBD to reduce the risk of leak. So coming back to this study that we have uh, discussed, uh, published by Moen, um, comparing the um, efficacy of EUSBD and uh, ERCP. And, and so here in the multivariate analysis, um, he was able to show that uh, the use of a plastic stent and the use of a non-coaxial electrocautery is some um, independent risk factor for adverse events. So, and in another study um, published by uh, Gupa in uh, 2014, it also showed there is a significantly higher incidence of cholangitis in patients with plastic stents. However, there is no difference in bowel leak. So overall, the recommendation is if you have a metal stent available um, for the use of an EUSBD, it is recommended over um, plastic stents. So then comes to the management of complications. So multidisciplinary support, including um, interventional radiologists, um, surgeons, anesthetists, uh, is required to prevent and manage complications in centers um, performing EUSBD. So EUSBD may give rise to severe adverse events like perforations, bar leaks, and bleeding. Um, it is advisable that surgical and interventional radiology Legi support be always available in centers performing these complicated procedures. So here I show um, one uh, complication um, that happened a few years ago. So I was the one doing the procedure. So this is an HGS um, uh, that was um, planned. So this patient had a distal bowel obstruction. So you can see here that I was uh, deploying the stent um, at that time, the um, deploy and channel technique was still not available. So I was trying to pull the scope back um, to deploy the stent. So you see here in the luminal view, um, initially everything was going fine, but then um, I did one thing wrong is that I pushed the scope into the stomach instead of pulling it into the esophagus to deploy the stent. So as I was pushing the stent, this whole stand was actually pushed out towards the peritoneal cavity. And this is what um, I saw after I deployed the stent. So this is a guide wire. And uh, this is um, the um, entrance site from the stomach. So luckily, uh, the guide wire um, is still um, in situ. So with the guide wire in situ, you can actually salvage uh, the procedure with the nut with the insertion of another metal stent um, at this point i also did another um, thing wrong is that the scope was actually the direction was not actually facing that of a stent so as you see the, as i pushed in um, the metal stent um, it the guide wire was actually pushed away the guide wire with the previous metal stent you can see here is actually pushed away and i was having a lot of difficulty um, pushing it in so at the end uh, it was a nightmare after another nightmare. So the um, guide wire was also dislodged. So what happened subsequently? Um, 
was then, of course, I consulted my senior, which is a TO. And uh, so what he did was uh, he closed the entrance site of um, the gastric opening with the eight, um, uh, previous opening site with um, over the scope clip. So first deal with uh, gastric perforation that was induced for um, during the procedure. So second is to um, deal with um, the bowel duct. So there was a stent that was deployed one end in the liver and the other actually in the peritoneal cavity. So the EUS scope was inserted and trying to find um, the stent and luckily, um, the stent was actually in a favorable position and uh, we were able to puncture the uh, previous stent, pass in another guide wire. And insert another fully covered uh, stent uh, to bridge the leak. So you can see the scope position this time is much better. Uh, the direction of the medicine is actually facing the previous metal stent. So the um, deploy of these, um, this stent um, is in a more favorable position. Uh, this patient subsequently uh, uh, had a collection, intra-abdominal collection, which uh, luckily uh, um, I was a, I'm a surgeon that uh, we went in and drained the collection. Uh, it was uh, quite stormy after the, um, even with this salvage, but um, these, the stent that was inserted subsequently bridged the leak and uh, we only had to deal with the, the um, collection subsequently. So um, again, this illustrates um, the uh, importance of uh, the subsequent recommendations in competency and training is that these procedures should only be done in expert centers uh, with facilities and expertise in EOS, ERCP, and PTBD. And uh, for example, in the case just now, um, if you are not able to salvage it with EOS means, you can always put in a PTBD, drain the collection, uh, close the perforation site with uh, endoscopic clipping. And, uh, train, and the 14th statement is that um, EOS BD should only commence in endoscopists who are experienced in FNA, wire manipulation and biliary stent placement, and um, that uh, PIG or ex vivo model are suitable hands-on training for EUS um, BD. So um, here, uh, I would like to wish everyone um, stay healthy, uh, keep calm and wear a mask and continue to do EUS. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shani. So um, before we move on, I would like to introduce the two moderators for this session. So Lawrence, yes. as Raymond, uh, will be moderating this session. And um, before the leaks lecture, I also would like to make a mention, Professor, to thank Professor Lazaro because uh, he's very been very kind to set up a real time translation of this workshop, entire workshop, into Spanish. Uh, Lazaro, maybe you can share the Spanish link uh, yeah. on the chat screen. So uh, I think I know it's late in Colombia, but I think we have over a hundred people watching in YouTube the real time Spanish translation of this uh, workshop. So thank you, Lazaro. Channel, excellent conference. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to. So, um, yeah, so, uh, I'll hand this session to Lawrence and uh, Raymond, and then you guys can uh, introduce the uh, uh, next lecture, uh, as well okay. as answer some of the questions. So I think uh, may maybe I'll leave uh, Raymond to introduce the next uh, speaker, but I have a question here from one of the, I think, uh, our audience. Okay, maybe Shannon can uh, answer this question. I'm, I'm not sure whether you're reading it. It is it's in the question and answer. It reads, uh, in hepatic bowel drains, if you do not use lamps, do you use a double pigtail to fix the self-expanding stent and decrease the risk of migration? Say you use normal metal stents, do you use a plastic stent, double pigtail plastic stent to fix the, the, the stent so that it doesn't okay. migrate? That's the, that's the question, Shannon. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, if you're talking about HGS, for us, we use a partially covered stent. So uh, the uncovered portion is actually within um, the bow duct and the covered portion then bridges the, the, uh, the 
bridges the liver and the stomach with a covered portion to prevent bar leak. So basically the uncovered portion prevents um, uh, stent migration. So for us, uh, we do not routinely insert a double pigtail to prevent stent migration. Um, I know that for some centers, if they use a fully covered stent, uh, they, they insert a double pigtail to um, prevent migration. Um, there are also other choices of metal stents, including some um, metal stents that have these flanges on the uh, proximal side to prevent uh, stent migration. So I guess all in all, uh, um, we're trying to, to do something to prevent um, stent migration, which is one of the most um, um, un unwanted complications from an HGS. So you can either choose an appropriate metal stent, and if you don't, um, a double pigtail plastic stent is uh, definitely a good way um, to prevent these stents from migrating. Just one more question before we move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, this uh, question, I'm not sure whether you're reading it. Is it difficult to use a cystostome on VC glide? And many times it does not work very well. So um, I think in this particular person, Ravindra, saying that uh, their, their experience is to use the Roma. Oh, um, actually, I also have, um, I also use this glide together with uh, six French sister tome. And uh, most of the time it works well. Uh, sometimes I've been in a few situations where the sister tome doesn't go through. Um, my feeling is it's not the problem of the guide wire. It's more problem with um, the contact of the sister tome and the setting um, of the sister tome itself. Because um, for us, we, we use our sister tomes. So sometimes for us, that is a major problem. Um, so if I encounter a problem, I change the new sister tome. Um, I don't really have a, a feeling that it is related to the guide wire. Lawrence, do you have um, um, any suggestion on that? No, no, I think the VC glide is actually quite good. Yes. <laughs> actually, uh, may I uh, supplement? Uh, sometimes the traction provided by the uh, nurse assistant is actually very important because sometimes the scope position could be more angulated or have some buckling on the wire. Then passage of the systotome could be difficult, but with some appropriate traction by the nurses. So uh, that may help you actually. Okay, good. So I think uh, we are sort of uh, into the slot of the second speaker now. So maybe I'll leave uh, Raymond to introduce uh, the second speaker. Okay. I have the program in front of you. Yes. So okay. our next speaker is Professor uh, Isayama. Uh, so Isayama Sensei uh, is a very uh, renowned uh, interventional endoscopist, um, you know, doing ERCP in altered anatomy patients, um, so expert in the US. So he needs no further introduction. Today, he's going to share with us his experience on the techniques and outcomes of US Rendezvous. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? And uh, now I want to uh, share the, uh, can you, I want to, now I'm trying to share the, uh, my screen. Can you see now? Yes, yes, we can see. But uh, I cannot see. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Can you see now? It's okay? We can it's see. okay. So, so I want to try. Uh, uh, so, uh, today's my topic is uh, uh, ES Rendezvous. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. Uh, to give me a very good chance. And uh, uh, it is a uh, very strange uh, to see you through the screen uh, to you. So yes, rendezvous. So it is a very uh, effective procedure. And uh, uh, it is a first three uh, published by uh, uh, Professor Freeman's group. Previously, we performed a uh, uh, rendezvous technique uh, using the uh, trans uh, hepatic route. Pactanius route. And uh, we are familiar with uh, uh, this uh, uh, procedure, but uh, uh, with the EOS, it is a brand new, uh, it was a uh, brand new procedure. So this I uh, show the Japanese ESBD guidelines recently published. So ES rendezvous, you can see here and here. So difficult biliary access. So patient with uh, accessible papilla, 
So we can perform the uh, both uh, uh, rendezvous techniques and uh, also uh, ESBD, so uh, CDS, HGS, or uh, integrated stenting. So it is a more uh, simple uh, algorithms. So for the ESCP access will appear. So yes, rendezvous. Sometimes a uh, uh, rendezvous techniques failed to pass the stricture. If the uh, patient with the uh, stricture, so at that time uh, we can uh, perform the EUS CDS or HGS. But uh, uh, without a stricture, so uh, maybe uh, uh, we should try again and again. So there are many steps of the EUS rendezvous. So firstly, uh, we should select a scope position. So transgastric or uh, transdural, uh, previously mentioned by Shannon. So and the uh, uh, punctured bile duct uh, with uh, uh, recently we use a 90 gauge needle and uh, uh, we prefer the uh, user uh, busy grade. And the injection of the contrast medium, guide wire in insertion. And uh, uh, this is a uh, very uh, difficult step. Uh, pass the papier uh, by uh, using the guide wire manipulation. After the a successful uh, guide wire insertion into the duodenum. So we should exchange the scope. So echo endoscope to the uh, duodenal scope. So standard ERCP scope. And the final step is a cannulation. There are many steps and a, a very time consuming uh, procedure. So this slide shows the scope positions in US rendezvous. So this one is a trans duodenal short position and a, a long position. Uh, this is a trans gastric uh, scope position. So there are some uh, uh, differences, uh, these are uh, uh, scope positions. So we, I, I prefer the, uh, this one. So puncture from the D2. So also uh, uh, previously mentioned by your, uh, the, me, Professor Shannon. This is uh, our previous review about uh, ES rendezvous. So uh, puncture success is very good, but the uh, total rendezvous success is not so high. Only Dr. Dio's uh, article is very high. Maybe uh, he's a magician using the uh, hydrophic guide wire and uh, he has uh, a very good NAS. Now maybe uh, uh, this side showed the uh, difficulty in the guide wire manipulation. And uh, comparing the uh, TD, transduodenum, and the transgastric, transduodenum is better. So uh, we should select uh, transduodenum rather than the transgastric to get a success. I want to show the, some videos. This is a transgastric. So similar with uh, uh, US HGS. So uh, puncture the left hepatic duct and uh, using the uh, bg grade guide wire. Uh, relatively difficult to pass a stricture uh, with a guide wire and uh, papier. And uh, in the uh, duodenum, after the scope exchange, catch the guide wire and uh, bring back. And uh, finally, uh, cannulation over the guide wire. So it is an old style uh, rendezvous technique, transgastric. This is a trans duodenum short position. So puncture direction is very good. So guide wire insertion and uh, toward to the papilla, very smoothly. And uh, also uh, other uh, beneficial is a very short distance between a uh, uh, puncture point to the uh, papilla. So then uh, uh, very easily to pass the uh, papilla by this technique. So I think the uh, puncture direction is very, very important. 
to uh, get the success to get to pass a, a papyrus. So uh, from this uh, point, uh, TDS is a uh, very good procedure, I think. So next one is a trans duodenal long position. So uh, puncture is relatively easier. So because of the uh, larger bile duct, CBD. So, uh, but uh, sometimes it's uh, difficult to uh, manipulate uh, guide wire toward to the papilla. So sometimes a uh, guide wire go into the uh, hepatic uh, portion. So then uh, I think the scope angulation and uh, uh, of course, so elevator angulation is very important to get a, a good direction toward to the papilla. So this is a, a TDL, long position. So this is a summary of the, uh, these three uh, techniques. Uh, my uh, junior doctor, Sabra Matsubara, uh, made uh, this uh, slide. So puncture site, TDS, D2, TDL, D1, TZ, stomach. And uh, it is very important point, scope stability. TDS is a very good procedure, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, scope stability is poor. At that time, so we should change the scope position, uh, TDS to the uh, TDL or TZ. And uh, uh, also a very important point is uh, uh, puncture easiness. And the uh, guide wire manipulation easiness is the uh, uh, most important point, I think. And uh, from the, these uh, uh, factors, I think the TDS is first line. So good puncture direction and a short distance to the papilla. And uh, this is our uh, yes Landeva algorithm. So first line is the TDS and uh, second line is the TDL. Sometimes uh, we should uh, select a uh, transgastric route. And uh, this is a, a special route, TDL, Holder uh, left IHBD. It is a very, uh, very rare case. So, Dr. Iwasita uh, published a similar algorithm. So, uh, first line, second line approaches. And uh, from his uh, article, so look, uh, guide wire manipulation is very poor uh, in a D1 puncture and a stomach puncture. So, D2 puncture is best. So it is a depend on the uh, puncture direction, I think. So, and also uh, uh, it is a very good point uh, to get a success in the uh, trans long position. So look, this is a very good uh, puncture direction uh, with a, a very good angulation with a scope and uh, also a, a elevator up. So both uh, guide, uh, scope angulation and the elevator angulation, we can get a, a very good uh, direction. It is uh, one of the tip to uh, make a uh, guide wire manipulation easier. Other tip is uh, using the hydrophic guide wire. So I think it is not only a guide wire by Dr. Binai, he's a magician. And uh, uh, using the uh, hydrophic guide wire, so uh, it is uh, easier uh, than the other type of the uh, guide wire. And uh, if we use uh, uh, this type of the uh, guide wire, we use a long uh, guide wire, but uh, they use a very short one. So, and uh, they use a special technique to exchange the uh, guide wire, uh, water uh, injection method. It is uh, sometimes uh, very risky to slip, lost the guide wire. Other tip is uh, also uh, published by uh, Dr. Iwashita uh, using the uh, catheter. They uh, called uh, this technique uh, hybrid uh, rendezvous. So you, they use a very thin tip uh, catheter but I think that it is uh, also we can use a uh, uh, standard ERCP catheter. So insertion of the uh, catheter, 
guide wire manipulation uh, easier. So then uh, uh, I think that this is the second step. So initially we use manipulate guide wire through the uh, needle. But uh, if we fail to pass the papilla, so we insert uh, uh, with initially withdrawn the needle and the insertion the catheter and the manipulation again. Sometimes uh, we can get uh, uh, success uh, via uh, better guide wire manipulation. After the guide wire uh, insertion into the papilla, uh, into the duodenum, uh, there are some uh, uh, type of the method of the cannulation, over the wire and uh, along the wire and the hitch and light technique. So it is very important, guide wire grasping and the pulling back technique, it is a very time consuming and the risk of the guide wire loss step. Over the wire required uh, this step. But uh, uh, after the uh, guide wire pulling back, Cannulation is very uh, easy. Along with the wire, can skip the, uh, this time consuming uh, part. And the cannulation method is very simple, but uh, success rate is very low. Lay, low. Because the basically uh, difficult cannulation, difficult biliary cannulation case. And uh, also a risk of uh, PD cannulation uh, leader pancreatitis. Each and light technique is a relatively new uh, method uh, provided by us. So this technique can skip the uh, guide wire grasping the bring back uh, step and the cannulation step very easy, but require the dedicated catheter. I will show you the uh, dedicated catheter like this. So make a slit on the uh, tip of the uh, Catheter. So I make I uh, make uh, this special catheter by myself uh, many times. So sweet is uh, so very uh, useful to catch the guide wire and the uh, insertion into the uh, bile duct. I will show you the uh, video. Hmm? Sorry, uh, don't work. So I will show you the next video. So this is a uh, ES rendezvous in one B1 reconstruction. So uh, we select uh, TDS in a very short position, but the puncture direction is a uh, uh, relatively so discrepant. So and uh, using the uh, basic grade uh, manipulation manipulation. And uh, uh, during the, this step, we gradually change the uh, scope angulation and uh, uh, adjust the guide wire uh, to, uh, to the uh, papilla. And uh, finally, uh, very nicely guide wire in. And uh, using the special catheter and uh, attach to the guide wire and the uh, insert. And the second guide wire from the special catheter inserted into the uh, bile duct. So I think the, uh, this technique is very easy to get uh, uh, biliary access in a, a landable technique. So this is a uh, Tokyo University's experience. Uh, Dr. Nakai uh, summarized our data. So uh, we experienced uh, 30 cases of the ES rendezvous uh, from the uh, 22 uh, original ESCP, uh, from the uh, uh, eight from the outside hospital, failed the ESCP at the uh, outside hospital. This is a result. So over the wire, 13 cases, guide wire loss three, the uh, change to the other type of the cannulation technique, one. Finally, uh, 12 cases. Uh, along the wire, a uh, hole, but uh, no success. And the uh, hitch and light technique, so all procedures succeeded. I will show you the detail. 
So guide wire travel in a uh, uh, many in uh, over the wire and the uh, conversion to the other method uh, totally in uh, along the wire. Uh, to uh, final video access uh, completely in uh, all the procedure. And then uh, look, time from puncture to the cannulation. So shortest in the heat and light technique. So uh, up to 24 minutes, 60, 60. So I think the so heat and light technique is a very easy. This is uh, our recent uh, case in Juntendo University. So uh, this case, the CBD stone and the failed cannulation. So we puncture the distal CBD uh, relatively thin, but uh, uh, succeeded. And uh, look, so toward to the papilla, very short distance and a very good uh, puncture direction. And uh, easily insert the guide wire into the duodenum. And the uh, papilla uh, in a uh, diverticulum, they are very difficult to uh, get a uh, uh, biliary access. I will show you the uh, cannulation video. So, uh, firstly, uh, puncture the uh, distal CBD. Sometimes uh, uh, this step is uh, difficult, uh, relatively seen, but uh, it is not so uh, difficult, I think. So after the uh, puncture, the injection of the contrast media to get a uh, cholangiogram. So and the uh, uh, change the scope. So echo endoscope to the uh, standard uh, diodoscope. This step. So very uh, uh, carefully. So, uh, so I want to uh, avoid the uh, uh, guide wire travel. So firstly, try try to uh, perform the along the wire technique. So very difficult to uh, uh, adjust the uh, direction. But uh, this is a, a special catheter a heat and light technique. So we can uh, easily catch the uh, guide wire and uh, smoothly insert a catheter. And uh, uh, finally, second guide wire inserted into the bile duct and uh, uh, get a, a barrier access. So uh, from this video, so hitch and light technique is uh, uh, better than the along the wire technique. Okay, this is uh, uh, my conclusion. So yes, random technique is an uh, effective but still challenging method. Selection of scope position according to the patient status. So uh, during the procedure, we can change the scope, the position. And the temperature direction was uh, very important. And the guide wire manipulation was the most difficult step. And the guide wire grasping and the pulling back step was a time consuming and the risk of guide wire loss. So I want to uh, 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 skip the, uh, this uh, step. And uh, I recommend TDS, transduodenal short position and the hitch and light technique. So I think this is a uh, fast line technique in a decent ES landable technique. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I finished my presentation. So thank you, Isayama Sensei. So a uh, wonderful lecture as, all, as usual. And uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, Raymond? Yes. Uh, I think there are quite a number of questions already, very popular with questions. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, maybe I think uh, Dr. Uh, Professor His Isayama, can you read the questions just below in the Q and A? Uh, Q and A. Okay, oh. then I, uh, if you look, look down, uh, there's a question from uh, uh, Dr. Laka. Laka, okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Starting from there, you said with the scope in the transduodenal long position, is it difficult to puncture using a 19 gauge needle? 
because the needle is quite stiff and the scope is in a long and angulated position. Okay? Yes, uh, so it is a uh, so very uh, important thing. So uh, recently we use uh, uh, Olympus needle. So Olympus needle is uh, uh, very flexible. So then uh, I think the I recommend you the uh, using the Olympus uh, needle. It is a uh, uh, more flexible than the other type of the needle. Other flexible needle is a Sonotip from the uh, German company. It is also uh, very flexible. And uh, uh, if you cannot get a, a very good puncture direction, I recommend you the using the hydrophobic guide, guide wire. So recommended by the idea. So uh, uh, performing the uh, transdiodinal long position, we should overcome the many uh, difficulties. Actually, thank you for your good question. Okay, uh, Dr. Yusama, Yama. Relating to this is um, because you're using a 19 gauge needle. The next uh, question from Dr. Tarun. Uh, what if you lose access after the puncture because a 19 gauge is quite big and it risks a bow leak? Mm. So, uh, thank you very much for a good question. So, uh, puncture is not so difficult, I think. So, the uh, perform usually performing the US FNA, so we can get a uh, uh, BRD puncture uh, even in the uh, uh, distal CBD. So, and the uh, bioleak, uh, not so many, I think. So, because of uh, uh, this area, so, uh, so, and the uh, duodenum and the uh, uh, um, uh, pancreas. So, not so a large space uh, between the uh, uh, duodenum and the pancreas. And uh, we, did, did, I didn't uh, experience a, a bioreak after the procedure. But uh, uh, usually, I place a plastic stent after the uh, every. Uh, US landable technique. So to avoid the uh, bioreak, it is my answer. Okay, so I think you, you have this very special hitch and ride uh, uh, catheter. Uh, the, one of the uh, audience uh, asked you about this thing. I think uh, can be fashion a swing throttle and then yes. uh, cut below and then use it as a hitch and ride. Yes. So uh, I also uh, uh, try to make a special casita uh, by a uh, with a uh, sphincter tome. It is also uh, we can, but using the uh, le le uh, mess. So and uh, so, but uh, sometimes uh, we should wear the uh, glasses. <laughs> At a small street we can uh, make, and uh, uh, before uh, performing the US rendezvous. Please try the uh, slit attached to the guide wire. So if you are uh, easily to attach to the guide wire, you can perform the hitch and light technique. Uh, please uh, uh, try to make a uh, catheter uh, like me. Okay, the, the, the question from Stephen Tong is, uh, how do you cut the catheter to make the, the, your special catheter? How do you cut it? You use a, 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 a razor or how do you cut? Ah, so the Caesar, uh, sergeant's mess, sergeant's mess we use, and oh, uh, also a cut, very very thin cutter. Okay. Hmm. So I think uh, we may there are quite a number of questions. We may be running out of uh, time now. Uh, Raymond, what do you think? You want to go on, or you want to? Uh, I think like uh, maybe we can save some questions after the next lecture because uh, there will be some break time. Um, I, I think if there are uh, other questions, maybe uh, we can use a little break time to uh, entertain too, but uh, maybe let's move on then. Okay, good. Okay, so, um, so we have our next speaker. So, um, so this is... Uh, Professor Doyon Park, and uh, so um, our good friend from Korea, and uh, he's going to share with us his experience on the technique and outcomes of EOS CDS. So uh, thank you.
Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So thanks to Professor Theo and others for inviting this uh, fantastic program. So today I will talk about the technique and outcomes of EUCDS. Uh, as you can see, there are several kind of the techniques for USBD. As you can see, uh, anti-grade staining or hepatic gastro or lung debut. And uh, sometimes we perform the colloidal duodenostomy, CDS. Uh, let me show the uh, advantage of the US CDS. Most important uh, advantage is, is this is uh, no procedural pancreatitis uh, because this is uh, avoidance of a traumatic papillary manipulation. And it's maybe ability to access the bile duct when the ampulla cannot be approached endoscopically uh, impatiently the duodenal invasion or so other uh, uh, situation. And another advantage of CDS is stent does not tra traverse the length of malignant stricture. As you can see, maybe a prevention of the tumor ingrowth or overgrowth, maybe a prolonged stent patency may have. However, downside of CDS looks like a reflux cholangitis in patient with due to invasion after placement of the US CDS with the plastic or metastans. Most patients with fed ERCP may have a due invasion or stricture. Sometimes difficult in performing US CDS and due bulb, and some syndrome in US CDS with lamps may have. Uh, looks like an easier procedure, but narrow endoscopic window in duodenal bulb uh, than EUS HGS because EUS HGS may be performed the freehand technique in performed B2 or B3 sometimes. is maybe a more uh, wider endoscopic uh, window for procedure. Now moving on the core techniques of EUS CDS. Before puncture, Looks like I think maybe CO2 insufflation may be uh, important for the prevention of the uh, double puncture in duodenal mucosa. You know, uh, duodenal bulb is sometimes in patient with duodenal invasion obstruction a little bit very uh, is a tricky area because the from the puncture sometimes may be difficult, and there's there's a little bit uh, not so ins insufficient. Uh, insufflation of CO, CO2, maybe uh, there is a uh, difficult for the puncture, sometimes uh, needle maybe double puncture, uh, maybe mucosa may have uh, some double puncture, maybe the, there's some, uh, some serious complication may have. And for 19 gauge needle, there is a possible chance of the very steep one. I recommend before puncture, uh, you can, uh, Maybe a uh, advance of a needle tip. Uh, so make can you can see the endoscopic view first. Then you can engagement of needle tip. First one may be important for before puncture, because uh, as 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 I mentioned, uh, nineteen gauge needle is a little bit difficult for the advance of the puncture sometimes. And during puncture, so I think maybe U shape or a long scope position for. USCDS with transmural stenting may be important. And sometimes you can check the fluoroscopic view of endoscopic scope position. I think it's maybe a full view echo endoscope better for USCDS with color enhanced lamps because uh, prevention of the double mucosa puncture sometimes, or it's very difficult for the puncture with the nighting gauge need in the flexible and long scope position in due and above. After puncture, O25 or O35 guide wire, you can choose. I think so for lung debit technique, O25 is better. But transmural, you can choose the transmural technique. I think so O35 is better because uh, you can don't need any uh, wide guide wire manipulation, just to push the O35 a little bit more wider uh, fistula track than O25. 
I think it's maybe more easier for technique for the system as a technique for further fixture dilation in O235 uh, guide wire. Then you can choose the formerly hurricane balloon dilator, dilator, dilator or fine tip catheter or one step dilator or color tip dilator. And then you can choose the meta stand, partially curved, fully curved, or ramps. Or direct puncture with electric color enhanced ramps. At the time, I think the uh, six millimeter is better than 10 millimeter because a possible deployment failure in 10 millimeter uh, no stand expansion with stock is my for, uh, personal experience sometimes. After puncture, you uh, first pick an echo endoscopic guide proximal stent deployment. Then endoscopic guide the distal stent deployment is later. Sometimes a tubular stent may be over direction of tubular stent may have. At the time, you can push the scope uh, with anti direction may have a uh, prevention of the reflux cholangitis. Uh, for wraps, I think so with a coaxial double pivotal plus stent is better for a direction of the stent or with ramps for uh, allowed of the uh, facilitation of the fire flow. Well, let me show the uh, USCDS with transmural stenting. Uh, as you can see, uh, scope position is a long scope position uh, with a U shape and needle puncture with 19 gauge needle and O to 5 with physical light I can frequently use. And there is a puncture of the US needle. Uh, then we have an injection of the contrast. And as you can see, guide wire is uh, a needle towards the hilum and scope is a little bit easier the fixed position than the ES guide hepatic gastro. I usually perform the uh, diesel is uh, uh, seven French in a um, metal tip is uh, no fistula for the dilation. It's a one step device for the uh, US CDS with transmural stenting. And then the, after, then we are deployment of the US needle. As you can see, this endoscopic view, this is a metal tip uh, with a seven French uh, the original device for here is a proscopic view and uh, is endosc echo endoscopy view. You can see the stent as deployment here. And uh, this third one, we can see the this endoscopic view for such a like kind of the EICP uh, endoscopic uh, transpapular stenting. Uh, this is another video. Uh, is uh, as you can see, the diameter is uh, CBD is uh, more ten or twelve millimeter is better for the puncture of the US guided collateral uh, guided collateral diodenostomy. As you can see, this U shaped scope position and long scope and auto five guide wire. Then we have performed the original device with uh, as like this one and is a uh, diameter is a uh, is a phone type is proximal one is a millimeter is a later one is a six millimeter as you can see for proximal stent my uh, deployment we are used uh, for the fluoroscopic and echo endoscopy view and this third one we can use the uh, echo endoscopy before the stent deployment as you can see here like uh, it's very similar to the ESP with transmural uh, 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 transpapillary stenting. Uh, this is another case. This one is the ES guy did a collateral students to me with uh, oh sorry. Uh, is market CBD dilatation. There is a, after perform the ES guided uh, puncture with 19 gauge needle, we have a, is a O to five guide wire is towards Harlem. Then we have a all in a device. Uh, we have pushed the, the push type of the 
uh, standard deployment system here. As, as you can see, we can see the mechanical tip, um, uh, metal tip of the here. Then deployment of stent. Uh, for this procedure, sometimes I use uh, prefer the O35 guide wire with Nikino needle because uh, sometimes it's very easier for the uh, track dilation uh, with uh, just original device without any uh, formula hurricane balloon, other system, other things. I prefer the some more smaller in introducer for prevention of the bio leak because uh, some kind of bioleak maybe have a possible chance of the uh, during change of the accessory maybe pass possible in the uh, ES CDS. Now moving on the outcome of the ES guide ES CDS, <clears throat> recently a GI published in the uh, Raji cohort study. As you can see, there is the individual analysis uh, or the adverse event, as you can see, there's a jaundice after procedure is looks like a uh, spontaneous migration one. Another is the visual uh, related cholangitis. Uh, interestingly, uh, US uh, CDS with ramps, their cohort may have a four case of tumor obstruction because, uh, as you know, CDS may have a uh, uh, advantage of the ESP with transpapular stenting in terms of the tumor overgrowth or uh, ingrowth because uh, stenting may have uh, uh, far away from the tumor. However, RAMS may have a tumor obstruction. Looks like uh, RAMS is uh, just a uh, uh, location with the duodenum, duodenum and the CBD. But sometimes the tumor may overgrowth with uh, uh, over the RAMS in the inside of bile duct. Looks like uh, I think maybe a uh, tubular stent is much better than RAMS in terms of the tumor overgrowth, overgrowth or ingrowth. Uh, in terms of the uh, bioduct diameter, it looks like uh, over the 15 millimeter is a uh, is a better for so direct direct uh, of uh, electric color enhanced lamps without any ES needle puncture or guide wire. I think it. Uh, this 50 millimeter is very important for the, uh, the successive, successive, successful factor or predictive factor. I think for uh, direct of uh, ES uh, in electro enhanced ramps uh, uh, without any uh, accessory such as uh, guide wire or a nineteen gauge needle. Uh, let me show the classic ES CDS. Looks like a tubular stand with outcomes. Looks like a Stent dysfunction uh, uh, more up to the 60, 60 millimeter uh, uh, overall, maybe at uh, 50, uh, uh, 50 uh, so, uh, percent. Looks like adverse event is uh, totally maybe uh, is uh, 22 percent. Technical success looks like uh, is over the 90 percent. Uh, outcome on ESCD as with RAMS is uh, looks like adverse events much uh, lower than classic uh, so CDS and uh, stentis function is a similar one. Technical success is uh, okay and looks like uh, procedure time may be much better, I think. Well, let me show the, our data. It's the uh, US CDS versus HGS in uh, subgroup analysis of randomized trial is for minor disappear obstruction. It uh, looks like a CDS HGS is very similar patient cohort to and patient with the duodenal invasion or so, uh, but a clinical success is, uh, and clinical success is a similar one. And procedure time is also similar. Uh, in terms of adverse event, CDS HGS is also similar. Uh, Re-intervention is also a very similar one. I think so maybe a CDS HGS is very similar and is uh, comparable efficacy in the patient with uh, migraine disappear obstruction. In terms of uh, primary USBD versus ESCP with uh, duodenal invasion, looks like uh, uh, our data with uh, meta analysis is uh, looks like ESBD is much better than ESCP in terms of the adverse event. Especially as a prostate 
pancreatitis or others may be much better. However, so in terms of primary CDS for the palliation of myocardial arrhythmia obstruction, there is a pros cons this may have. Pros may be a, a expert, may have a similar technical and clinical success rate adverse event compared with the ERCP. And potential benefit uh, for patient with borderline risk of pancreatic cancer, maybe undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy, maybe in terms of better stent patents and lower rate procedural pancreatitis. However, looks like it is not so gained popularity and lack of dedicated device in some uh, country or some center. I think some uh, substantial learning curve may be required uh, for beginner. And biolic and stent migration not completely resolved by conventional BRI metastent in ESBD. And still, given a small patient number in previous clinical trial, primary use of ESBD for migrant BRI disappear obstruction may be premature. Uh, take home message is, uh, is my take home message is ES uh, CDS may be safe and effective method for palliation of migrant disappear obstruction after failed ERCP. USCD as with electric color enhanced lamps is Tenno. yeah with this new norm audio can be a problem Shannon you have to yeah. speak very loud <laughs> from your stomach yes okay uh, so um, have you heard the case history they are trying to remove the virus from the voice so <laughs> it is a little bit <laughs> slow <laughs> okay so uh, basically now my scope I'm using a linear echo endoscope. And uh, I'm now in the duodenum. Um, so uh, maybe I'm Raymond can speak while oh, Shannon okay. does the procedure. Oh, hold on, hold on. So uh, now Shannon uh, has her scope in the proximal duodenum. Uh, we need to volume up the oh, microphone volume. Okay. volume. Hello, can you hear us okay? Okay, can you hear me better? Hello? Okay. Can you hear us okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, can you try Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Can you hear? Can yes, you hear? we can hear you. Ah, yeah. okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, now so I'm now in the duodenum. And, uh, and you see, uh, the, uh, dilated the dilated CBD. Dilated CBD. So before, so before uh, the procedure, uh, the procedure I actually, actually pulled back, pulled back um, the... Um, the ow, ow. Pulled, ah, the I actually, I actually pulled, pulled back, back um, the PTBD. The PTBD. So, the PTBD so the PTBD initially, initially was in the distal bowel duct. So in order, so in order not, not to obstruct, obstruct um, the, the puncture, puncture, I pulled back I the pulled PTBD, back PTBD and, uh, and did a contrast, uh, did a contrast uh, study for study this patient. For this patient. Uh, so you uh, can so see you now can the see CBD now is right is here. Right here. And, uh, incidentally, and incidentally, we actually, we actually found a portal vein thrombus. Uh, which was uh, not which was seen, not seen, on, seen the on the PET CT before. before. Are you seeing some uh, abnormal, abnormal collaterals collateral that obscuring that your puncture, that may interfere with your puncture? Um, um, actually, you actually see you it's, see quite, it's a quite a lot of blood vessels, vessels nearby, nearby, but here... But here um, um, You can see you can that there is a there vessel, is a vessel um, along, um, with, along the, with the uh, CBD. CBD. So, any tricks on uh, Shannon, how to yes. can you uh, trace down window? the portal vein thrombus and the tumor position? Okay, so the uh, CBD... Is it started because of tumor infiltration or what was the cause? Oh, it's probably due to tumor infiltration. So you see here, this is the uh, CBD. If you trace down... You see the tumor right here? I can see some of the, it is associated with probably the tumor. Yeah, so yeah, this is likely a tumor thrombus. Tumor thrombus. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and at the same time, you can okay, also- we can see dilated CBD and the portal vein flow and also several collaterals. Mm. Now we can uh, see the epinephrine surge from so you Shannon's body, <laughs> and we can enjoy this. <laughs> and so, you can so also are see... You, uh, what are you planning? Putting in axios? Uh, so on US, you also see some ascites right here. Um, 
So what is your opinion? So if, uh, um, if the patient has ascites, do you think it's uh, still safe for a CDS? Yeah, that's the CBD. Yes. Uh, any preference on the diameter of the CBD that you would like to see before your puncture? Um, I think uh, at least one centimeter, but now it seems uh, I cannot find a, um, a puncture site that um, I can safely uh, avoid the vessels around, the tumoral vessels. Lots of collections. Yeah. That looks that looks okay. So with the axials I think it should be okay. 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 Um so for this patient actually there are two options that we can go for. Um he failed the RCP before. before. So either we can use the PTBD for a Honda ERCP, so pass the guide wire through the PTBD and graft it within the RCP. Or we can go for CDS. Uh, Raymond and Anthony, we lost the video. Uh, yes. 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 Uh. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. So, 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 The US video is not on a big screen now. But the, the Shannon's voice is clearly audible. <laughs> I think Sean is sharing the screen, so uh, we'll have to share that. So anyway, we can use the So now we're so measuring, now we're measuring the, CPT. the CPT. And, uh, and uh, it measures... It measures okay, don't. Okay, don't. So it measures, so it measures uh, 10.3 uh, 10 millimeters. millimeters. So it would so be it would better, be better if, we if we can inject uh, more, uh, more to dilate, to dilate the, CBD. the CBD. So can we so inject can we more, inject more to, the to the PTBD? Mm. Okay. Uh, uh, there is like. echoing, howling. So the engineers need to control this. Oh, this is saying. Oh, this is saying. Oh, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. Saline is, okay. is okay. Uh, so now uh, you so can now see, you can the, see CBD the CBD is getting, is more, getting dilated more dilated because, because Raymond is, uh, is uh, injecting saline, saline into, into the common bowel duct. Yes, but there is still echo. Uh, so. Okay, so, okay, so uh, can, can you see the you US... See the US uh, uh, you? Yes, you? we can see USB clearly. Okay. Okay. So, so I think, I think um, um, there is a there large, is a vessel, large on vessel on this side. side. So rotating so, okay. the scope to this side. Okay, the voice is very clear now without any echo artifact. Okay, can you hold the scope? So you can see on uh, x-ray um, that the CBD is uh, in front of uh, where we are going to puncture. So Raymond, do you agree that we should go forward? I think so. Well, let's, uh, let's, uh, I think those small vessels could be uh, okay. So we're our uh, because of the voice issue, we did not hear your plan. What is your plan here? Uh, Are you going to use a uh, lens or? We're going to use a hot axios. Okay. Uh, so you see now my scope is uh, pointing upwards uh, yes. towards the hilum. Uh, because today we're using the hot axios, 
So puncturing a little bit closer to the hilum is uh, still acceptable. But if the plan is to put in a uh, longitudinal biliary stent, probably puncturing uh, more distally would be more favorable for stent deployment to avoid uh, covering the uh, hyla region. Uh, but because we're using the axios, so uh, that probably uh, would be less of a problem. So now I have a 19 gauge uh, EC shot, as you can see on the uh, screen. So now I'm going to puncture the CBD. Seems a little bit hard to puncture, okay. Mm. Looks like you're in. Okay. Uh, so aspiration. So our bow is aspirated. And now contrast injection for a cholangiogram. Yes, we have a cholangiogram, yes. Okay, so yeah. we'll insert the guide wire. So uh, in our center, we routinely use uh, 025 uh, curved tip. So this is the viscid glide. So Shannon, you are deploying the hot axios over the wire, uh, not yes. doing a direct puncture. Uh, no, for any CP. Re any reason for that? Um, I just tend to prefer to be safer um, for okay. about that. Uh, yeah, puncture. Yeah. Um, for larger targets like gallbladder and pseudocyst, I do direct puncture, but mm. for this, it's uh, 11 millimeters and a lot of a big portal vein behind. Right. So I would certainly not like to double puncture the CBD um, for this. So now we're exchanging the needle um, for the wire. So it's important to keep the uh, guide wire in the US view all the time. Uh, so the hot axios actually comes with a 6 millimeter, 8 millimeter, 10, uh, and 15. Uh, so for this, I this I think I will use the eight millimeter. Okay. Uh, what about you, Raymond? I I think I think six and eight would be okay. But I think uh, if you have a bigger duct, then uh, obviously eight is easier. But uh, if you have a small duct, uh, six may be easier. But I think this looks fine. I think. And looks like your uh, axis of the wire uh, looks favorable for the passage of the relatively stiff axials, right? Yes. So um, I think maybe just now we skipped a part uh, because the video, ES video wasn't seen. So if I was going to puncture more at the distal CBD, my scope would be more in an up position and the direction would be more uh, pointing towards uh, the ampulla. So it would be, yeah. the direction would be less favorable. Uh, so yes. that's why I um, uh, pointed the scope on x-ray uh, more towards the hilum. I, I always do this before I decide where I puncture because the direction is very important. Uh, the CBD size, usually it's uh, one or 1.5 millimeter, uh, 1.5 centimeter. So there is not a lot of space for you to push the stent in. So it is uh, important to make sure that you have enough uh, landing zone uh, for the stent to go through. Shannon, there is a question uh, from Nikhil. You know, he was in Hong Kong with you. Um, if you are using a longitudinal a tubular stent, would you dilate this track? Would I what? dilate the track before placing the stent. Oh, uh, yes, yes. So stent. usually uh, we use a six French cystotome and then a four millimeter hurricane balloon uh, to dilate okay. the track. So now the hot axios is in.
So you can see it on the US view. And now the setting we're using is a 120 period cut mode. So now I'm going to push in. So you see uh, like that in. it's easily in. Yeah. Uh, for CBG, the bounded wall is very thin. So it is um, important to stop the uh, energy right after you puncture the CBD. Or else uh, the portal vein is always behind. And uh, there may be uh, thermal injury to the posterior wall causing a delayed uh, bout up perforation. So now the uh, distal flange is in. So we're going to deploy. So on USV, you see that it's pulling back. OK, very nice. Yeah. Yes, excellent. So this very is nice. the um, distal flange deployed. So for us, we always use uh, the deploy in channel uh, method. So now I've pulled back the um, distal flange. Okay. And now deploying the proximal flange in the channel. And then we're going to change the scope back to uh, the OGD view. Yeah. Okay. So gradually, I would put in a torque mm. and push out the stent. Oh. Oh, looks like it's out already. Huh? Yes. Okay. Okay, some gush of bio. Yes. Yeah. All right, very nice. You can see it deployed the stent and yeah. also virus coming yes. from the stent. Wow. Yes. So do you usually, would you recommend putting it a double pigtail for these uh, cases? Yes. Ah, so you always put in, in a double pigtail. In this case, especially because there is... Uh, uh, some blood and a clot may form and block it, so it is mm. better to place a double pigtail. Okay, so usually what size of a pigtail do you use? So we use a short, the shortest that is available, a six centimeter double pigtail. Most of the times uh, they tend to come out and hang down, but uh, it, it makes us uh, feel safer during the immediate post stent period that if there is a problem, there is a biliary drainage always available through the stent. Okay. What length are you using? Are you are you putting a stent or are you, are you leaving it like that? Oh, of course, I'm taking your recommendation. <laughs> 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 so we're going to put in a, a 10 French, a 3 centimeter double pigtail. Yeah. Because sometimes these clots, uh, they are temporary. It will go. The bleeding will stop very soon. But the clot formation can cause uh, obstruction temporary. Michel? Yes. Do you put a plastic stent always? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, I've had a few cases where actually the, the axios will will literally oppose itself against the wall of the bowel duct. Right, and so right. just by just by placing a pigtail, you basically disimpact, you basically keep the axios away and doesn't right. allow it to suck against the wall, the right, opposite right. wall of the bowel duct. Right. So for this reason, I think uh, the puncturing direction is important. So as I mentioned, if you go for more distally and when your scope is more in an uh, U position, then your direction would be, uh, the stent would be almost perpendicular to the common bow dot. But if you angulate it uh, right. like this, then the stent is more likely to be at an angle <laughs> to the CBD and um, less likely to uh, cause the back wall to hit against the stent and causing obstruction. And also, I think you had a very narrow window because of the collaterals. 
<laughs> so you went uh, more proximal. <clears throat> Mm. So in this case, uh, would anyone rather do a ERCP with a uh, rendezvous uh, technique with a PTBD? You know, Shannon, I love rendezvous, so don't ask me this question. <laughs> <laughs> Even uh, because PTBD is already inside, so... Yes. Uh, if the patient is not, uh, not complaining discomfort, PTBD alone can be also useful. Mm -hmm. Or uh, through the PTBD, we can inject uh, uh, some contrast or saline and dilate the bile duct. And even we may try ERCP, standard ERCP. I think but currently, if he fails, uh, yeah. Tio is conducting a randomized control study comparing uh, ERCP and a CDS for these uh, malignant biliary obstruction. Um, I think the underlying uh, hypothesis is that the stent patency, uh, because mm -hmm. for CDS, uh, we tend, we are inserting the uh, stent away from the tumor, uh, mm -hmm. while for uh, ERCP, the mm -hmm. uh, stent is within the tumor. So. Uh, we're still waiting for the results uh, for that study. Yes, uh, that uh, would be a good uh, study. Mm. Uh, but uh, stent yes. inside the uh, stent is pushing the tumor away I from see. the bile duct. So why? Can you make the fluoro big? Please. Ah, how much you X-ray die? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think um, These are very, very challenging cases. Mm. You know, the visibility and all those things, so great job. <laughs> okay, I'll already deploy, wait. Mm. Yeah, I think we punctured uh, quite close to the hilum, so there right. isn't a lot of uh, space for the gray catheter to pass through. So it's a bit tight. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, you started from is... long U position, and the, the scope position is quite stable. Mm. From the beginning until now, it is the same. This is very important and very advantageous. So Shannon is uh, demonstrating a, a stable scope position. This is tricky. Actually, we don't have much room to operate in the narrow duodenum here. So uh, quite different from um, yeah, yeah. the stomach, actually. So uh, some very fine movements and... Uh, okay, so now okay, we so see the marking. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so you just have to be really slow and with patience. Yes. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. And 
need some good coordination between the assistant and the endoscopist here. So. Sometimes it's a little hard to uh, to disengage. Yeah, the, the position. Yeah, the yes. position is such that it may be difficult to. Yes. Yeah. So any tricks from the panel uh, when you encounter some restricted uh, scope uh, maneuvers due to the anatomy? Uh, so, um, and you try to pull the scope a little bit back, make yeah, it I'm a little okay. straight, yeah, and then. So I'm trying to rotate. Uh, okay. So we all know that if you turn a right, your scope goes down to D2. Yes. So now I'm trying to do a left torque for the whole scope. Mm. So gradually, hopefully, it will come out. Yes. Uh, because if we pull back the scope, uh, I would lose a long loop position. Yes. And uh, it would be less stable. So I usually try to rotate um, so that I don't suddenly fall Right. Out of the uh, duty, no. Mm. I think some distal part of the stent is already deployed, right? Yes. Uh, I think uh, uh, what she's trying to do is to uh, get the pigtail out of the channel. So. Yes. And uh, she's trying to generate some space, but uh, I think it's hard to do it in the duodenum. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, because uh, it's very uh, small space. Yes. Okay. No, so no, now it's, it's good. Now you can push it out. Yeah. yeah. Well, because the uh, pusher of the out has uh, been. Oh. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> we have so all gone through this. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, so very uh, real life uh, situation, right? So uh, every case yeah. is different. Yes, 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 yes. It's a great, great demonstration. Yes. yes. This is the beauty of life. <laughs> Lecture always goes as planned. <laughs> life, a life is different. Yeah. <laughs> Masterly demonstration. Very yes. Good. So and uh, 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 Shannon, if you are not able to push it out, just pull it, uh, pull it out, and put another stand. Yeah, I think uh, the, the stand is deployed, and uh, the pusher yeah. is not working. So I'll use something else yeah. to put the push the pigtail yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah, maybe use the swing trotome or something. Mm. So anything that is large enough to push it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe I should well, have used an 8.5 French. Uh, would would have made it easier. Yes. So Shannon, so maybe like oh, let you work on this a little bit, and then looks like Tio has something ready for us. So maybe we'll have a case presentation and come back to you later. Okay. 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 Shannon, fantastic, great <laughs> job. Thank you, Doctor. Really so great. thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Yeah, good work. Uh, so um, we have a second case. So uh, okay, we're gonna share the screen. Okay, let's see the... Okay, can you guys uh, see the point here? So, okay, so this is the second case. And we have a 74-year-old gentleman. Uh, he has metastatic uh, cancer of the pancreas with peritoneal metastasis. So a uh, CT scan from June showed a big mass at the head of the pancreas with bitter obstruction uh, and also polar vein encasement. Uh, unfortunately, uh, ERCP in July failed uh, due to duodenal obstruction. So here's the mass, here's the CT, and then um, the cervical mass causing duodenal obstruction. So uh, today, a uh, patient is here for EOS guided HGS and duodenal stenting. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Can you hear uh, me? Can you yeah. see uh, Anthony's face? Can you hear me? In the scopy room. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Yes, yes. We can hear you. You can hear me. Okay. So please show the endoscopic view. So this patient has a pancreatic cancer with the, uh, double obstruction. Um, 
I'm having a trial on um, comparing partially covered versus uncovered stents. So I already inserted a uh, partially covered duodenal stent for, for this patient. So now I have a linear scope. You can see this is the, in the aorta. My scope position is in the um, OGJ. So I'm going to just quickly show you the anat anatomy and the pathology. So this patient has um, quite a dilated PD. Dilated PD here. And then if I trace it down, this is the PD. And then towards here, you will see a big tumor mass around here. All right? Yes. Yes. And then if I go back up, so I'm going to go to the left lobe of the liver to assess the puncture site. So this is the left lobe. So um, if we perform an HGS, again, we usually try to target the segment 3 ducts. So the, this is the segment 3. Here, this is the segment 2 ducts. So this is the segment 3, which is dilated nicely. Um, the size is around 7 millimeters. Eight, okay. And uh, to perform HGS, you, we usually, I usually prefer to puncture the segment three ducts because uh, there's less of less risk of mediastinitis. Uh, if you have to puncture, sometimes the segment three duct is not available, then you have no choice but to puncture the segment two. But uh, if you puncture the segment two, then you need to be careful because uh, you might end up with the stand in the esophagus, and you need to check your position frequently. Okay. So I'm using a 19 gauge flex, Boston Scientific flex needle. So this flex needle is made by a nit uh, with nitinol. So uh, it is, uh, has a very good flexibility. So you can see a needle in, the, in a good position right now. So uh, I'm going to start puncturing. So any suggestions, advice, comments? Would you do integrate for this patient, uh, Vinay? Nice and easy for you, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Obvious. I'm going to move forward. <laughs> but in this case, no, Anthony, you have a diurnal stenosis. So uh, I will probably agree with you. We'll do an NGS. Yeah. So my needle is in already. You can see bio aspirated. Yes. And then I want contrast. So, Anthony, is the patient flat or left lateral? Or I have uh, the patient in uh, prone position. Yeah, CP position. Prone. Okay. 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 Uh, baby, say line. Oh, okay. Say line. Whoops. Thank you. Okay. Say line, please. Thank you. That's a very nice puncture. Okay. So I'm going to inject some saline because uh, the contrast may be quite uh, sticky. Yeah. So we're going to put in a 025 uh, BC guide, guide wire. So uh, the plan is always uh, emphasizing the importance of thermal hydrophilic guide wire manipulation. But uh, you're using BC glide, uh, no problem with that? Um, I think most of the time with the O25, it has a very good maneuverability. So, so far, so good. No, it's a very good wire, uh, Dong one. The VZ Glide is an excellent wire. The only problem we have sometimes is uh, the cautery because we use cystotome in almost all cases. Uh, sometimes, I don't know why, the cautery doesn't seem to work. That's the only issue. Otherwise, it's a great wire. Mm -hmm. See how easily. Uh, Anthony has maneuvered it across. All right. So, yes. So, Visiglite uh, 025 is very good for p my own uh, p uh, operator manipulation. So, can we exchange the guy? Exchange. Anthony, you are always manipulating the guide wire by yourself. Uh, <laughs> a lot of times, yes. Because uh, times. we do workshop every weekend. So. <laughs> <laughs> we, I, we have to learn how to manipulate ourselves. No, it's, okay. it, it's a very good lesson, actually. If, if you know how to manipulate, no, 
it, it helps. Yeah, it's a very good lesson. Sometimes. I agree. Yeah. Yes, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can see my scope is in a very good position. The wire is very straight. Excellent. Um, yes. I'm going to change to a Sisto Tom. Six French to dilate, followed by um, Geo Boss. So, um, as you know, um, recently the hot spexes has become available. Um, so, um, the hot spexes has a uh, cautery enhanced tip. Uh, I've tried it, it's very good. So, uh, the hot Geo Boss is also uh, underway. So right now we still need to change uh, one or two instruments in between the stand deployment and also um, uh, uh, track adaptation. Um, I think uh, if Doyon Park is here, he also he has a uh, stand which is called the DS stand from MI Tech. And uh, that stand is also very good because it has a dilator um, attached to the front of the um, delivering system. So I think um, the world trend is towards a single step device. Uh, why? So I agree. If you have uh, multiple steps uh, on the same procedure, there is more risk of bilic and more risk of uh, failure and complications. Better to have a single step device. All right, so um, my um, sister told me here, it's here ready. So I'm going to burn my track. Anthony, six French. Sorry? Is this a six, six French sister? Six French sister, Tom. So very nicely, it's, we're inside already. OK. OK, so I uh, can we have the uh, uh, open the scent? Great, OK. So I need to do it slowly, because the other room is not ready yet. <laughs> You're going too fast here. <laughs> You're going too fast. Right. You are very fast. Yeah, okay. please explain. Uh, okay, anyway, we need to exchange. Okay, so how about us maybe talk about the stand you okay. choose? Okay, so, so I'm so. using the um, Taewong Geobo stand. So this is our usual stand. Um, it's um, 10 centimeters times okay. uh, 8 so millimeters uh, in diameter. So um, it's a quarter uncovered so the uncovered end is in the in the hepatic duct and the cover end is uh, bridging the stomach and the liver so, so um, huh? sorry 70 30 cover and yeah 730 so i think for hgs the most worrying part or the most uh, stressful part is the percent deployment so just now you can see all the puncture and dilatation is relatively straightforward but uh, with stand deployment, when you first start to do the procedure, because a lot of times you can't see the stand position very well. And uh, when you deploy the uh, proximal flange, uh, also you need to be familiar with deploying in the channel technique. So um, let's uh, change the stand. Do an exchange. Tio, are you seeing any ascites in this patient? Uh, there's a little bit of ascites, but um, not from the position where I punctured. So, so if they have a lot of ascites, do you always have some ascites drainage before you do this procedure? Yeah, that's a good point. You, we try to drain the ascites uh, uh, beforehand if there's a lot of fluid. Because um, first of all, it can affect the healing of the fistula. Uh, second of all, we can cause an uh, infection of the acidic fluid as well. So. Um, if there's a lot of acidic fluid, so we try to drain it. Uh, if you see some fluid on EOS, you can also try to drain it on EOS, but that's a bit uh, cumbersome. Mm. Uh, okay. But you can avoid a second procedure for the patient. Um, if you don't have the geoball stand, uh, I think um, people will use a fully covered stand as well. Uh, that's a slightly increased risk of uh, migration. Um, some people would use a double pigtail to anchor that. Um, but uh, if you insert a double pigtail, be careful because um, there is a small risk of uh, causing the metal stand to dislodge. So, um, yeah. in a in a new uh, newly created HGS, 
If you do too many interventions uh, through the HGS, uh, you need to be a bit more careful. So right now I'm inserting the stent. So usually for HGS, I won't dilate the track. So it should go in. All right, good. And because this is in a uh, baby tension, tension. Yeah, pay attention. Yes. So very nice. So you're making a pretty sharp uh, turn here. So, so any tricks? Yeah, you need to be careful because um, you can always uh, dislodge yourself. Mm -hmm. So right now, um, I think I'm in a good position. Uh, we can start to deploy the stand. It should deploy inside. Um, my landing site is uh, uh, okay, I think. Mm -hmm. So I'll probably land around uh, this area. So can we start deploying? Okay, good. It's opening. So the stand is going inwards. Mm. I'm going to pull the stand backwards a little bit. <laughs> Try to readjust my position. Yes. So Tio, how do you position that uh, marker between the cover and uncover portion in a, in a suitable position here? Yeah. So now you can see my I'm adjusting my scope position, right? Mm. Just now it's a very long loop. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to pull back now. This is a marker for the uncovered uh, to covered mm -hmm. proportion. So I adjust it slightly, and then we deploy the stand. Okay, deploy. Yeah. Nice. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now the stand uh, opening is up to my scope uh, channel. So I'm gonna open the rest of the stand in the channel. Okay, so now the stand is completely opened. Okay, I'm going to change to uh, endoscope view. So this part is most difficult for beginners because uh, you cannot see the stand very well. But uh, because the stand is already opened, we can push the stand slightly out and then pull the scope a bit backwards and then do the same thing, pull, push the stand a bit out. So now you can see the stand a bit, a little bit in the um, one o'clock position. So now I'm going to pull back the scope again, push the stand out, pull back, push out, and then now you can see the stand very well, and then push out the stand. Okay, okay, so now, now that stand is completely deployed. Okay. Very nice. So um, nice. this is the way that you should you can do the HCS. Um, yes. It has be it's you, you can you have to do it very controlledly. Can you keep the wire? Um, and then um, it is my routine to do a cholangiogram after the HCS because um, there's always a small chance that the uncovered portion is outside the intrapic duct. So if the uncovered portion is outside the IHD, there can still be a leak in the liver parenchyma. So this takes a l another minute or so, but I think it's a good practice because um, um, HCS, the most worrying thing are, are leaks. And these patients are usually quite um, frail. So if they have any infection or leak, um, they usually uh, would be more uh, um, stormy. Okay, mm -hmm. can we have the uh, assist autumn? Anthony, yes. when you start the deployment of stent, I'm sorry, say again. Uh, you inserted the bare part of stent deep yeah. into the angulated uh, intrahepatic duct. Yeah. So uh, it was uh, uh, quite a big safety margin. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, it depends on the patient as well. So sometimes the anatomy doesn't allow you to insert it so steeply. Um, there is a small risk that the stent can cause uh, obstruction of the peripheral ducts if you insert it so deeply. Uh, but in general, I think uh, these segmental cholangitis can be treated with uh, antibiotics and rarely need uh, additional drainage. 
Um, this stand is uh, eight millimeters in diameter, so it's okay. I'm inserting my systolome now. Okay, why? Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, okay, no. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here. Okay. Oh, so I'm gonna inject some contrast. Come to see, come to see, come to see. So hopefully it works. Okay, so it seems like there's no leak. Okay, so I'm happy with this. So any questions? Oh, nice, nice case. It's Lazaro. A Hi. question, do you use it, uh, a traumatic needle? Excess needle, yeah. So excess needle was defined, designed to avoid um, 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 shearing of the wire. But uh, from my experience, uh, shearing still occurs with the excess needle. So um, I'm not a big fan of the needle. Um, and uh, for HGS, um, it's tricky to use the excess needle because uh, sometimes you don't go into the duct uh, immediately. And sometimes you have to adjust the position of the needle. So um, if that happens, then um, you would need to reinsert the stilet. And uh, because the needle is quite stiff as well, so sometimes that's very difficult. So um, I don't usually use uh, excess needle. OK, thank you. OK, so I very think nice there's one more case. Um, we only have five minutes or 10 minutes or so. So let's, I think, Raymond, are you ready to present? OK, so we are back here. OK, um, can you hear us? So we're going to yes. have a presentation here. So this is a 69-year-old gentleman. And uh, again, uh, this is a case of uh, cancer of the pancreas, uh, status post, uh, web post operation in April 2019. Uh, he has recurrence uh, since this year, uh, some tissue near the portal and different mat. So uh, he developed apron limb obstruction in May. And uh, years ago, the apron limb drainage was performed but uh, apparently there's also bound up obstruction. So PDBD was inserted. So um, here's the cholangiogram of him by the PDBD. And you also can see the axials uh, uh, addressing the issue of the apron limb obstruction. So today uh, we're going to uh, attempt ELCP through this apron limb uh, and plus or minus uh, US caterpillar drainage. Raymond, we uh, heard the case history. Can you go to the endoscope room? Okay, so hello. Hello. So Shannon is on air now. Okay. Uh, so a few weeks ago, uh, I did the... Can you briefly summarize what happened in the previous case? Ah, so this case had a history of uh, pancreatic cancer with whipple... No, 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 the previous case. Oh, your case. Ah, we uh, we we put in the uh, pig tail. Uh, okay. Successfully. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Please go on. Uh, so this case had a Whipple's operation before for pancreatic cancer, and that was a recurrence, causing apron limb obstruction. And a few weeks ago, I put in a hot extra for apron limb drainage. So you can see here on OGD, there is a bit of a, um, a berry bumper. So the stand is actually. Um, a little bit buried within the uh, gastric mucosa. Uh, the patient subsequently had a PTBD also because of biliary obstruction. Uh, do you see the X-ray view? So a I've small X-ray view now, yes. Uh, so, so it's only X-ray view. Yes. Uh, can we see both the endoscopic and X-ray view? Um, so I tried to inject some contrast through the um, PTBD. So now my scope is uh, through, uh, right through the axial stent, uh, but there is actually some tumor in front of the stent. So my scope cannot pass into the um, aphid limb. Okay. So now I'm still quite far away from uh, the, the bow dust. So yes, what would you do, Professor Isayama? <laughs> 
Professor Isayama, are you there? So, Dalai, what would you do? <laughs> uh, using using the guide wire. How about uh, using the guide wire? Guide okay. wire. And, uh, so we try to use the guide wire through the PPVD and see if I can catch it on this end. <laughs> So they may not be able to hear. So Tio is asking if uh, Dr. Vinay has any um, suggestions. So I would like to see, uh, Shannon, what is the EOS picture there? Uh, what is happening in the liver? Vinay uh, 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 wants to see the EOS picture. Because I'm now using a 2T scope. Uh, oh, initially we were, okay, okay, we were okay. planning to go through the stent and just uh -huh. generate the uh, bowel from the low. Okay, okay. So now okay. we're trying to catch a uh, guide wire from above. So Tio is now manipulating the guide wire. Very tight picture. <laughs> So Tio said he thinks he can't go through. It's actually yeah, an HJ. It's, it's tough. It's um, tough. Mm. It's quite stuck. Yes, it's a very tight narrowing. <clears throat> so would you do uh, HGS and A? For this that case. would be my yeah. I would look at the EUS uh, because I think uh, um, you mean it again. Going, going through the axios is going to take a very long time because it looks very tough structure. Um, probably the easiest way would be uh, to access the left hepatic duct and place a stent there. <clears throat> So it probably won't be very easy because the IC is not very dilated. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to, you, you won't get easy cases, Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good, very good case. So luckily you have a PTBD, so I think that might help you. <clears throat> Anthony, are you going to do HGS? I think we already observed the technique of HGS live uh, before. So it may be overlapped and the time is already past the two. We cannot hear your voice clearly. You mean now? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, so I think um, it's okay for us to conclude this uh, live session. Um, um, thank you very much the for the comments. <laughs> um, we still have some sponsors to show during lunchtime. They have some message for us. Um, any last questions, comments? Uh,
I think uh, this is a wonderful setup, uh, uh, composing with the didactic lectures and also including live demonstration. Uh, as we have seen this uh, live demonstration, live case always have variability and we can learn from those variations. So I think uh, it was a wonderful uh, setup and a wonderful meeting. I have no further comments. Deny. Anthony, fantastic. Great cases. Uh, I would have loved to see the third case, actually. But... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, thank you very much. I think our former will um, share a screen, and uh, we will come back after lunch. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.